Your Voice, Your Vote 2023 Memphis Mayoral Debate starts right now. Live from the Memphis Music Room for the Performing Arts and Education, ABC 24 helping you decide the next mayor of Memphis. An important election to be sure, but also one of the most unique, considering the last time there was no incumbent running for mayor in a regular city election was more than 50 years ago in 1971. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm ABC 24 News anchor Richard Ransom, and I'll be moderating tonight. Joining me here on the panel is ABC 24 News commentator Otis Sanford. Otis is also an author columnist for the Daily Memphian and retired journalism professor at the University of Memphis. Representing the Tri-State Defender tonight is its education columnist, Curtis Weathers. In addition to being principal of Memphis's first charter school in the early 2000s and Hamilton High School after that, he also founded a nonprofit for developing the leadership capacity of young men called the Brotherhood Boys to Men. And since we're bringing you this debate right before the season debut of Monday Night Football here on ABC 24, we cannot ignore that Curtis was a football standout at Ole Miss, who went on to be a linebacker for the Cleveland Browns in the early to mid 80s. All right, now before I introduce the candidates, we should tell you that based on their polling and fundraising numbers, we invited seven of the 17 candidates who will be on the ballot, and six said yes. The only candidate who declined is former Memphis Mayor Willie Harrington. So let's introduce introduce you to the uh, six candidates who thought it was important to be here tonight. From left to right, as they will appear on the ballot, is Floyd Bonner, currently the sheriff of Shelby County. Next to him is Karen Camper, who has represented her Memphis district in the state capitol for the past 15 years. J.W. Gibson is a Memphis businessman and former Shelby County Commissioner. Then Michelle McKissick, who currently serves on the Memphis Shelby County School Board. To her left is Van Turner, also a former Shelby County Commissioner and most recently head of the Memphis NAACP. And finally, Paul Young, currently head of the Downtown Memphis Commission. Now, all the candidates have been made aware of and agreed to the following rules for tonight's debate. Answers can only be a minute long. A green and red monitor that they can see uh, will show them how much time they have left, and they'll be able to hear the ding of a bell when their time is up. Can we hear the ding? All right. <laughs> Follow-up questions will be allowed at the discretion of the panelists. If one candidate invokes the name of another, that candidate will get a 30-second rebuttal. And each candidate will get one minute at the end of tonight's debate for closing remarks. Now, questions were determined by the three of us here on the panel, as well as from viewers, as well as from some community influencers around town, many of whom will be asking their questions in person tonight. One word for the audience who's here. Uh, we appreciate you being here, and we know many of you have a favorite candidate. We ask that you not interrupt with applause during the debate. In fact, let's go ahead and get it out of our systems right now. Uh, round of applause for all the candidates who are on stage tonight. Appreciate you being here. All right, candidates, let's start with questions that are for all six of you. Uh, they will be answered in ballot order from left to right. That way, each of you will get a chance to go first. So here we go with question one. We are all aware of the challenges facing Memphis, and most of these 90 minutes will be spent addressing those and discussing those. But something we haven't heard much about during this campaign is your passion, your vision for the city. Voters want a mayor who will not only work to fix our problems, obviously very important, but also someone who has a bold plan that will take us from being stagnant, and many would argue losing ground to our peer cities, to a city that's thriving and moving us ahead. So with that in mind, and with polls showing that most voters are undecided, then they have to actually back to a certain candidate at this point, each of you please take a minute to make your case to voters tonight. Please inspire us as to why you should become the next chief executive of Memphis. And please share a new idea or two that we haven't tried yet that will help turn things around. Floyd Bonner, we'll start with you. Well, thank you, Richard, and good evening to everyone, and thank you for having me here. To your question, I am excited about Memphis. I'm excited about the opportunities that are headed our way. There's so many things, great things that are going on in Memphis, and there are going to be great opportunities for our young people here in this city. Uh, the bowl and, and the things that we have uh, with Blue Oval coming, the, the spinoff jobs, and so the next mayor needs to be aware of that. He needs to be conscious of what's going on around us and, and working with all the 
municipalities, or municipalities around us because what's good for Memphis is going to be good for Shelby County. And if we want to be a, lead, a regent leader, then we must show ourselves friendly and lead by example. So Memphis can be the example. We can be the thrust to uh, to to lead our country, lead our region in our area. So we're excited about the opportunities to be the mayor. Karen Capper, inspire us in 60 seconds or less. <laughs> Thank you so much. Memphis is poised for greatness. If you think about Blue Oval City coming and all the things that it's gonna do to transform this region, Memphis is gonna be the leader. We're gonna have an opportunity to attract so many supplier companies here. We're, we're gonna have an opportunity to support and build our black businesses with contracting, business opportunity, people that wants to be in electric vehicles. So Memphis is there. We're ready for poised for greatness. We need the right leader to get us there. Secondly, I'm excited about this program I have called the Votech Zone, which is an innovative way to attract our kids, teach them workforce, and have fun at the same time. And when we build this center, this vocational technical zone, we will eventually extend out into all the community centers so our kids are involved and love it and having a great time in our city. Thank you, Karen. J.W. Gibson. Thank, Thank you very much. much. As a businessman, the first thing that comes to my mind is a business opportunity that we hadn't taken advantage of. Memphis has the river, rail, roll, and the air. We're geographically located pretty much in the center of the United States. And we have a port authority that hadn't been quite used efficiently, in my humble opinion. So that's the first thing I will take a look at and talk about how we expand those opportunities. One of the things that I'm really, really passionate about is Memphis music and the entertainment industry. We have a wonderful commu uh, creative community that hadn't been tapped. When you hear people talk about Memphis music, mostly it's, this is, it's the historical perspective of what we used to be about, the, the, the Al Greens, the Isaac Hay days. But right now, Memphis has some of the best talent in the country, and we need to promote that talent. Matter of fact, we had an event here just two Fridays ago representing that local talent. All right, thank, thank you, J.W. Gibson. Michelle McKissick. I absolutely love my hometown. It's just something about it that's so special, which is why I focus on Whole City Memphis. That's my plan, my platform that I developed to how to make Memphis even better, to how to make Memphis the capital of the South. We need to believe bigger for our city and invest more in our neighborhoods, our communities, and also come together. We're operating in silos with the public and private sector, the nonprofit community, the philanthropic community. I want to see us come together with Whole City Memphis. One of the ideas I'd love to see is truly make the music highway between Memphis and Nashville, the music highway. We love to hate Nashville, but you know what? We can capitalize on what we have going for our cities. Blues and barbecue in Memphis, hot chicken and country music in Nashville, and really promote that in terms of tourism. And also, finally, focusing on young people. I hate it that our community centers are not open, that we don't have our pools open, because we don't have enough lifeguards. Why don't we partner with the YMCA so that we can train all of our children how to swim during the school year? Some of them will be good enough to become lifeguards, so then we can open up our pools and have our, our children being our lifeguards. Thank you, Michelle. Dan Turner. We've heard it time and time again. Memphis is on the precipice of greatness. Memphis is right there. We've just not been able to cross that threshold and be the city that we dream about. Well, this is the time, this is the opportunity to make that reality happen. But we have to invest in our disinvested communities. What happens is that we build up downtown and midtown, and we should keep doing that. But what happens is that all the rest of the community is neglected. Our young people are marginalized. They don't feel the investment. They don't feel the love. If elected mayor, I'll make sure that we make robust investments in our community because when those communities rise, everyone rises. And we're not talking about that enough. We have to address poverty. And once we do that, we'll see the new Memphis that we all love and know it can be. Light rail is what I'm pushing. We need to make Memphis the Memphis of what it looks like 40 or 50 years from now. And that is key. We also need to refresh our airport. You can't even fly in or get out of Memphis. We need a, a, a better airport situation, and we need more airlines at the Memphis airport. All right, Mr. Turner, thank you. Mr. Young. 
So for many, many years, Memphis has been the city that is almost there. As long as I've grown up in this city, I always hear about the promise that we have in our community. It is time for Memphis to realize its potential. Uh, I'm a son of this city. I grew up in the Oak Haven area. I love Memphis. I, I went to school for city planning because I wanted to figure out how to rebuild our neighborhoods and communities throughout this city. And that's what I've been doing for the past 20 years. And that's what I plan to do as mayor. I want to rebrand our city. We have so many people in our city that are doing amazing things, but we've allowed 1% of our population to define us. We are not a bad city. All of our community is not engaging in criminal activity. All of our young people aren't engaging in criminal activity. We have to allow our greatness to shine. I want to rebrand our community. I want to rebrand our city. I want to invest in our neighborhoods in a way that we've never done before. And I want to invest in our young people. I want to take Memphis to the next level in this next chapter. All right, thank you, Mr. Young. Otis, you get the next question. Thanks, Richard. Candidates, if you win, you'll be taking over a city where crime is up in almost every category and affecting just about everyone. Now for some context here, we did some checking on the most recent numbers as of last week, and what we found was alarming. The number of people who have had their cars stolen is up more than 87% this year, with more than 11,000 stolen. That's about 50 cars stolen every single day. Business burglaries, many of them smashing grabs that we've reported on, is, are up 40%. And as of last week, the city of Memphis has reported a homicide almost every day, 243 so far this year, up 30%. Now, Mayor Jim Strickland's administration spent all eight years trying things like offering signing bonuses and moving bonuses to new police recruits. He got through major salary increases and even relaxing residency requirements and allowing officers to even have more tattoos. Despite all of that, the complement of police officers has barely moved the needle, let alone come close to the plan uh, 2,500 uh, officers. So, aside from hiring more officers, please tell voters the three specific things you would do to combat crime. And Ms. Campbell, we'll start with you. Thank you. The first thing I'm going to do as your mayor is we have to take a look at the entire ecosystem around crime, not just law enforcement. We've got to work with the justice system. We've got to work with the courts. We've got to work with juvenile court. We have got to make Memphis the priority for everyone to come together around and believe in changing and reducing crime. So we need a long-term strategic plan. And I plan to do that with the nonprofit communities and faith-based communities and all of the elements within there. Secondly, I feel we need to review what we're doing, what's going right, what's not going right, how can we do better, what are the efficiencies, the deficiencies that we have. Third, we have to reform what we're doing. What we are doing is not working right now. We have to reform it. And then we need to build trust between law enforcement and our communities. And we can do that through community policing. Okay. Ms. Gibson. Thank you for the question, Otis. First, I have to share with you, in my humble opinion, this crime issue is a very difficult issue. And I want to be emphatically clear that I don't think this is something that MPD can handle by itself. We're going to need community engagement to truly address the issue of crime. One of the first things that I would like to do within the first 100 days of me holding office is to create a campaign of taking back our streets. Today, we got too much recklessness going on on our public streets, from the drag racing, to the donuts, to the running traffic lights, to what appears to be uh, dodgeball games on the highway. We have got to take back our streets. We have got to be able to say to those who are creating those activities, criminal activities, that we're serious about our work. So we got to toughen up on sentencing. 
we got to stop the revolving door. And along with hiring, I do think we need to invest in technology, crime technology. Okay, Ms. McKissie. Otis, it's not just about being tough on crime, it's about being smart on crime. A part of my whole city safety plan for Memphis is what I call the three Ps, where we are partnering with police, we are providing justice, we're also having crime prevention. By partnering with police, I'm talking about hiring more detectives. As you said, that we are understaffed for a city of this size, and the FBI says only four and five crimes here in Memphis, uh, they go unsolved. And so we need to hire people who can actually go after the folks committing the crimes. And then when it comes to providing justice, we clearly need some bail reform because it's just, you know, having people who are committing violent, serious crimes. This isn't about policing poverty. This is about getting at the folks who are doing serious, violent gun crime. And then when it comes to preventing crime, that's investing in our young people, as I was talking about with something like swim lessons, for example. When you invest in young people, meaningfully invest in them, that's when you can prevent crime. And then I'd love to hire a crime czar, someone who can work across agencies with the MPD, with the Shelby County Sheriff's Department, and with our private private sector as well to get at this problem. Okay, thank you. Mr. Turner. Thank you. If public officials were to execute the jobs that they were elected to do, I think it would be further along. Sheriff Flora Bunner was elected as the sheriff twice, and yet he wants to leave that post and be mayor of the city, but he's in the exact position that he needs to be in to fight crime. I don't understand it. My plan involves a crime lab. We need a crime lab here in this city. We need to make sure that we are processing the DNA evidence so that when the prosecutors get the case, they have what they need to secure meaningful prosecutions. Next, we need to address what's going on with the gang activity, RICO. We're seeing the RICO statute used now in Atlanta. We've seen it used against the mob in New York. If we tell these young people, we're gonna do everything we can to save you, but if you go and commit crimes, we're gonna charge you with the RICO statute, and it's not just five or 10 years, it's 20 or 30 years. And finally, we need to make sure that we're using technology in a better way and more comprehensively to fight crime. Okay, before we get to Mr. Young, you did invoke uh, Mr. Barner, and I think he gets 30 seconds to respond. I get 30. You get 30 to okay. respond to just that. Thank I get you. to you on the next question. Thank on this you, question. Otis. And, and to me, that shows what little Mr. Turner knows about policing in Memphis and Shelby County. As the sheriff's office, we are responsible for unincorporated Shelby County. There are seven municipalities in Shelby County, Memphis included. The mayor, as well as the police chief, will is in charge of law enforcement in, inside the city limits of Memphis. However, when we're called upon, and we have been, and when we have been called, we have responded. So we take care of unincorporated Shelby County, the others. Okay, thank you. Help. Now, I'll get to you, Mr. Young, with can the you, original question. Can you repeat question. the question? Uh, sure. Well, the, the basic question is, after everything that's been tried, everything that, uh, that the current administration has done uh, to increase, off, uh, increase the number of officers, we haven't moved the needle, and we have crime numbers that are out of control. So what three things, specific things, would you do uh, to try to combat crime? Yeah, I've often said on the campaign trail that it's going to take a two-fold approach. One, we've got to hold people accountable, and we must intervene and prevent crime. Uh, when it comes to the accountability side, uh, we want to make sure that we're making efficient use of officers' time. Uh, our officers are spending time doing things that is just a time drain. Uh, one example is when an officer is arresting someone, it takes them about three hours to process them at 201 Poplar. Three hours. And so that's time lost. So we want to do an, in, an audit and make sure that we are reducing and streamlining time so that they get spend more time on the street with the officers that we have. We're going to continue to work to increase that complement, but we got to be efficient with who we have. Uh, we want to use technology to address the chaotic driving that we're seeing throughout our community. Uh, it is crazy what we're seeing on our streets, and technology can be used to apprehend those that are continuing to do that. Uh, last thing is targeting our intervention. We know which young people are headed down the wrong road. We should directly intervene in the lives of the ones we know are headed on the wrong path. Okay. Now, Mr. Bonner, you get to respond to the original question. Yes, sir. Thank you again, Otis. I have a plan that's called Desk to Duty. Right now, we have officers that are in precincts that's working. All of us will say, or some of these candidates will say, that we need an additional three to 400 officers out on the street. But what you did not hear, what I did hear, was a way to get those officers out on the street. So we have a Desk to Duty plan where we're going to put officers back out on the street. That's 
that's doing things in the precincts where they could be out working outside the, the precincts. So we also have officers that are working on cameras or doing minor things. We're officers. Right now, we need all hands on deck, Goldis. We need everyone. Then we can use data smart policing, knowing when the crime, trying to predict when the time crime will occur and where it will occur. Use technology, cameras in underserved communities, so many of our communities that don't have cameras. And finally, community policing, when we get the numbers up, that's what we'll do. All right, thank you, Mr. Bonner. Okay, Curtis, next question to you. Thank you, Richard. Candidate. We're going to show the viewers watching at home Memphis's population trends going back more than 30 years. In the 1990 census, the city's population was around 619,000 people. In 2000, in the 2000 census, Memphis's population shot up just a little over 650,000, due mostly to annexation. Ten years later, it declined to around 647,000 people. Then, in the most recent 2020 census, the population declined to 633,000 citizens. Now, get ready for this. In just the past two years, from 2020 to 2022, according to the U.S. Census, our population declined dramatically to around 621,000 citizens. That's almost 2% in just two years. Employers complain all the time that they have open jobs, but too many of our youth do not feel like they want to stay here in Memphis to develop their careers. Meanwhile, Tennessee's three other major cities are growing by double digits. It's hard to hire cops and upgrade infrastructure when the tax base is shrinking. So, since Memphis has been unable to stop its population decline, how do you plan to pay the city's bills when more people are moving out of Memphis than moving in? Mr. Gibson, we'll start with you. Thank you for the question. So as a businessman, I would suggest to you the first thing that we need to look at is how do we increase growth throughout the community. There's jobs that are available, but we don't have workforce training that's properly being put in place by the city. We need to increase our opportunities for our training of our youth so that those jobs can be filled. I also believe there's a lot of opportunities, as I alluded to earlier, just in the logistical industry that we hadn't been taking advantage of. We have got to create growth. We have been stuck for decades here in Memphis and Shelby County. As a business leader, I see an opportunity for us to do something totally different. The creativity that I think I bring to the table, the vision that I have for what could be here in Memphis, I think we can turn those numbers around and start getting people excited about living in Memphis again because of what we're doing to prepare them for the jobs, what we're doing to take advantage of some of the, night, the natural resources we have available here in Memphis. Thank you. Ms. Kissack. We need to focus on our young people because we are experiencing a bit of a bank drain, brain drain here in Memphis with so many of our talented young people that go off. You know, you want to kind of escape your parents and, and go off to college, but we want to make sure they come back. So one of the ideas I'd love to do is uh, actually introduce Memphis to young people while they're still in high school because the high school, um, the Memphis you experience when you're in high school is different from the Memphis you experience as an adult. Something else, though, a lot of young people, they don't want to work for somebody else. They want to focus on entrepreneurship. They call themselves multi-hyphenate entrepreneurs. I know because I have three young adult sons, and that's the language I hear all the time coming from them. So this is about how do we go about creating maybe a, 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 a set of contracts with the city, perhaps, that is specifically designated for young adults, from those who are like from, I don't know, 25 to 35, something like that, to help them realize that they can be a part of helping our city to grow and to invest in them. We invest in them, they'll invest back into the city of Memphis. Thank you. So we have to make sure we're investing in those communities which have been disinvested. When was the last time we built something up, any meaningful something up, in Whitehaven, Hickory Hill, Boxtown, Frazier? We built up downtown and midtown again. We've not invested in the community at large. And so what happens is that the community at large is frustrated 
They don't feel a part of this city and they lash out. We can build our numbers back up once we make proper investments in the community. That's what we're missing. Poverty is the issue. Unless we address the fact that your zip code determines your lot in life here in Memphis, Tennessee, we won't get it done. We will never get done what we are trying to do. Your zip code should not determine how you fare in Memphis, Tennessee. Until we address that issue, we won't get the population up that we need, and Memphis will continue to languish. So I appreciate the statistics that you guys provided, some additional stats. Uh, in 1980, we had roughly 620,000 people in our community, and we were roughly 200 square miles. Now we're over 320 square miles with almost the same number of people. And so we've expanded our territory, expanded the amount of things that we have to pay for, and the same number of people are paying for it. And we're seeing the results. That's why it's so difficult to have a strong transportation system. As mayor, my goal is to make sure that we're making deep investments in the anchors of in our neighborhoods, in the heartbeat of each community, because the ultimate way to resolve the problem is to build up density. We need more taxpayers in the core of our city. We have to have quality of life amenities in the heartbeats of our community. Things that make people want to be there, that make people want to invest there. We also have to focus on growing income in our community so that as property values increase, the community can afford to be there. Mr. Bond. You know, the other night, we've been to so many forums this, this, during this process. The other night, I was at a forum, and I saw two elderly ladies that told me that if they could, they would leave Memphis, and I asked why. And they said, because of crime. They said that we are fearful of what's going on in and around us here in the city of Memphis, and it literally broke my heart. So we can talk about other developments. We can talk about economic development, but a safe city is a prosperous city. We've got to make our city safe. I talked to one of the business leaders here in this town, and he said Memphis has one of the youngest workforces in the country. Blue Oval is exciting. Blue Oval will bring jobs, the spinoff job. We've got to have our young people excited about wanting to stay at home. We beat ourselves up so much in our community, and, and what we see on the news is happening all around us. But I believe that we can turn this thing around, and as mayor, I will do that. Ms. Kemp. Thank you. I agree that we need to address crime initially because when people think about living in the city, they want a safe city. So we have to address crime. But we also got to invest in our neighborhoods. So many of our neighborhoods have been neglected over the years. And once we invest in those neighborhoods and build them up, then people are going to live there. So we also need to think about partnering with our education system because that's the other thing that brings people in. They want a good school. So if we, the city of Memphis, decide that we're, we're going to invest and partner with Shelby County Schools, reduce crime, and then build up our neighborhoods, that's going to attract people back into our city. We also got to clean our city up. People want a nice, clean, safe environment. We got to deal with the potholes. These are things that bring people back into the city so that we can increase our tax base and pay for the services that you say we cert certainly deserve. All right, Ms. Camper, thank you. Now, candidates, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've asked some community influencers for questions they wanted to ask you. Uh, each one of these will be answered by three of you who were randomly selected. So this question will be for Paul Young, Karen Camper, and Michelle McKissick. And it comes from a familiar face, or at least a familiar voice, on Memphis radio. Listen. Hi, I'm Bev Johnson, talk show host for WDIA Radio. Candidates, my question is, the city of Memphis has an office of youth services to help the youth in our city. As mayor of the city of Memphis, would you leave that division in place and do you have any other ideas that could help our youth become more engaged in positive activity? And would you use other resources that could help that division stay strong? Okay, you heard it from Bev herself. Paul Young, yeah. you first. 
So yes, I would absolutely leave that division in place. I think it's a very important asset to our community. Uh, a lot of the work done in that division is around employing young people. Uh, I think there's about 1,500 that are employed now. We certainly need to grow that number. I'd love to work with the private businesses in our community uh, to make sure that they're adding additional slots to support young people. Uh, when it comes to the young people in our community, my goal is to make sure that we are a partner to Memphis and Shelby County Schools. Uh, we know that over 60% of the factors that drive educational outcomes happen outside of the classroom. That's the perfect place for the city to be making investments. As Memphis and Shelby County Schools educates our young people from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., my goal is to make sure that we're engaging those same young people from 3 to 7. So activating our community centers and extending the hours, uh, making sure that we're working with our churches, making sure that we're identifying nonprofits. I want to work with the groups that are already in our community doing the work for free and finding funds to invest in them to support our young people. Karen Capper, what's your response to Bev's question about youth services and helping our kids overall? Yes, I agree that I would keep the department, but I would also, I feel as if we're going, we need to make a historic in number of investment dollars into the programming so that we can, I think we've put, we've, we've kicked this down the road far too long, to be honest with you. So we do need to make a historic investment so that we can partner with businesses and nonprofits to get more jobs available for our uh, kids. But this is where I really want to do this vocational technical zone. It is an innovative zone of activity where a child may come because they want to be in performing arts, but they're learning about makeup, they're learning about wardrobe, lighting, stage, all of this stuff you see here, that's what they're going to learn in the zone. If they want to be flying drones, they'll fly the drones, but they'll also have a maintenance shop to fix, this, to fix the drones. So they are having fun, but they're learning at the same time. Let's say they want to do culinary arts. It'll be like chopped. So we got to be innovative in our thought of how we capture our kids. Michelle McKissick, your turn. This is Hello, my name is Ted Townsend. Oh, I'm president and CEO of the Greater Memphis it, Chamber. <laughs> As a region leading. Okay. We'll get to Ted in a minute. Now, they spoiled my surprise here. All right. Uh, Michelle, you go next to, the, to Bev's question. Thank you. Uh, this, this subject is very near and dear to our heart and was so great hearing Bev's voice in this audience. Um, but I, I think what we need to do, obviously, we definitely need to keep that program, but we need to really expand it. Right now, it only serves about 1,500 kids a year. Well, we have 110,000 in Memphis Shelby County schools alone. And so I would love to see us at least the first baby step that we increase it to at least 5,000 students and we really cast the net wide so that everybody is aware that the Youth Services Division even exists. A lot of folks don't even know that that's a resource for the city of Memphis. And so the city of Memphis has got to get back into the business of caring about its young people and that's what I want to do as the next mayor. We have some money that's about to come available to the city of Memphis, $50 million as a matter of fact, of revolving funding that we can use to help expand our reach into our community centers so that they're open later to help alleviate parents having to pay for aftercare, that our community centers are open till 7 p.m. in the evening. There are so many ways that we can go about helping our young people and letting them know we care about them so they will stay in Memphis and invest in Memphis and help us grow. All right, very good. Now, one more question from a community influencer for our other three candidates. So Van Turner, Floyd Bonner, and J.W. Gibson, you'll get this one from, as you know, Ted Townsend. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ted Townsend. I'm president and CEO of the Greater Memphis Chamber. As the region's leading economic development organization, we have the responsibility of recruiting companies to invest and create jobs in Memphis. As mayor, if you're sitting in the final meeting to close a deal, what are you conveying to them about you and your administration that will convince them to select Memphis? Ben Turner, we'll start with you. First, we have to make sure that we have all of the incentive packages together and that we are competitive. We know that Mississippi is growing, DeSoto County is growing overnight. We know that West Memphis is on the rise. We have to make sure that we're competitive and that our incentive packages are where they need to be. We also need to talk about the beauty and the greatness of Memphis. We need to talk about Beale Street, Stacks, Graceland, all those things that make Memphis, Memphis, the people. And I think that that is a selling point in and of itself. There's no other place in the world like Memphis. We grit and grind. 
We're ready on day one because we are Memphians and we don't give up and we will make sure that we are going to accomplish our goal. And finally, I have to lean into the fact that we are at a strategic place where you can go almost anywhere uh, without in throughout the Mid-South by driving. You're close to Little Rock, you're close to Nashville, you can get to Jackson, Mississippi, you can get up to Louisville, Kentucky. So you're in a position to where you can go out throughout the Mid-South. All right, Floyd Bonner, how are you going to close the deal? First thing I'm going to do, Richard, is go get the best barbecue in Memphis. <laughs> then we're going to pile it up on the, on, the, on the table and have a free-for-all. No, we, we're going to be serious about our, our intentions. Memphis is a wonderful city, and we need, to, we need to tout the things that we're strong in, our music industry, uh, uh, the Blue Oval, uh, just talking about the passion that people in, that live in this city and have lived in this city throughout their lives, uh, the passion that we bring to the table. Uh, Memphis is such a great town. We're, we're, on the, we're on the cusp of greatness, and you try to sell those companies that don't you want to be a part of that. So when Memphis explodes, you want to be there on the ground floor at the very beginning when we accelerate into the future. And we have a bright future ahead of us. And as the mayor, I'm willing to be there, be the biggest cheerleader from Memphis has ever seen. J.W. Gibson. Thank you for the question. As a businessman, I tell you, I look forward to partnering up with the Chamber of Commerce and some of our partners in the, com in the creative community to go out and make these sales calls. I'm excited about the opportunity that Memphis has to offer to other corporations who are looking to relocate. Again, I point to the resources that we have, the natural jewels, the river, the rails, the roads, the air. We have a lot to sell here in Memphis that's not being sold. We have got to change the optics. For those who might be going out selling Memphis, we have to be of a totally different mindset when we go forward to these corporate offices talking about what's great for Memphis. Memphis. Because there are a lot of great things here in Memphis, and we have to be about the business of selling those things. As I talk to our potential partners looking to move to Memphis, not only are we going to be talking about those subsidies that might be available to them, we're going to get their buy-in to the need of being a corporate friend to the community and giving back. All right. Thank you, sir. Well, now we want to go to our round of individual questions. Uh, candidates, each question is for you alone uh, based on your experience or based on your campaign so far. And like all the rest, you're going to get one minute to answer the question. Now, this time we're going to go in reverse ballot order. Uh, Otis, uh, you have a question for Paul Young. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Mr. Young, as everyone knows, this is a nonpartisan race. No one will have a D or an R next to their name on the ballot on October 5th. Now, you've said that you are a Democrat. Mm -hmm. However, twice since 2016, you have voted in the Republican primaries. Um, and you've, again, you've said that you are a Democrat, and this is a largely Democratic city. Mm -hmm. Now, at a time when we are highly partisan on a host of issues, voters are going to look at a candidate who best represents their interest. So how would you assure the majority of voters in Memphis that you will look out for their interests as mayor? Yeah, so, so thank you for that question, and I'll repeat what I've said over and over, which is I am a Democrat. I've done some strategic crossover voting in Republican primaries, uh, but what I like to drive people to are the results that we're seeing in our community. Because we've had Democratic leadership, Republican leadership, and when you look around our communities, the results have been the same. The people in our neighborhoods, when I go to Orange Mound, when I go to North Memphis, South Memphis, they're not asking me, are you a Democrat? They're asking me, what you gonna do? How are you gonna change the conditions that I'm seeing in my community right now? And so what I do is I rely on my track record. Look at the work that I've been doing all across this city. The people in Memphis need results, not partisanship. And so I'm a Democrat, but I'm going to get the job done. That's what I want people to know. Okay. All right, Curtis, now it's Mr. Turner's turn. Sure. Mr. Turner, where you live has, has become an issue in this campaign. Until recently, you lived in unincorporated southeast Shelby County. Only recently told the public you bought a home in the Binghamton area. 
A report by the Daily Memphian investigating your MLGW bills showed you were using so little water at your Binghampton home, you could not possibly have lived there. How can you assure voters tonight you will level with them as mayor when there have been questions about something as simple as where you live? Thank you. Mr. Young indicated that he's a Democrat and that there's not a Democrat or Republican way to run the city. If you look to Nashville, Republicans are preventing us from passing sensible gun laws in this city. Democrats would have passed sensible gun laws if they were in charge. I think this election is about what you've done for the city. I represented District 12. I represented Hickory Hill, which is a large part of the city. And I fulfilled that commitment. And after I fulfilled that commitment in District 12, I moved to the city. I purchased a home. And we started renovations. Now, because of the lawsuit, which took about six months, we ceased those renovations in order to deal with the lawsuit. The chancellor ruled that we were viable candidates, that we were able to run for office, and so I proceeded forward. By that time, I needed to move into an apartment, and that's where we stay now, in Beanhampton, because I'm committed to the Beanhampton community, and we move forward. It's not about what people say they've done, it's about what you've done, and I stand on my record. All right, now to Michelle McKissick. Uh, you were recently the chair of the Memphis Shelby County School Board. At the time, the school board dealt with the controversy of Dr. Joris Ray, who resigned with a golden parachute of about $500,000 amidst a sex scandal. As chair, the public never really learned the details surrounding that investigation. You still serve on the same school board that's been unable to find a new superintendent for more than a year now, and spent $57,000 of taxpayer money on a national search firm, and still, we have no superintendent. So what would you say to a voter who doubts whether you can lead this city given the turmoil the school board has seen recently? Well, first of all, we haven't had a superintendent search in over a decade, and I'm one of nine. I was leading at a time where you have to build some consensus, and that was a very, very touchy situation. Unlike some of the other candidates on the stage, I didn't have that chief executive decision to make the decision that I personally wanted to make. You had to work with what was best for the students of Shelby County, which is what we did. We focused on getting children back into school safely during a really critical period of the pandemic. We got laptops into the hands of over 110,000 students. We started a testing program for our students and our teachers. We did all of those things, and as the board chair, this this is what I was dealing with, the immense stress that the entire world was dealing with, but I still got things done. So moving forward as the next mayor, being the chief executive where I can make decisions without having to get a consensus of eight other people, unlike, you know, Floyd Bonner, who's the chief executive, 40 people have died under his watch. He has some choices to make there. Paul Young over the Downtown Memphis Commission. Here he is. He can't keep Bill Street and Downtown Memphis safe. I'm going to work hard to, to do that for the okay. city of Memphis. All right. Now, yeah, all right. You've invoked a couple names here. Uh, first of all, I'll let, we are going to ask you a question about the jail. And that's probably not going to surprise you, uh, Floyd Bonner. So we'll get to you in a minute on that. Uh, Mr. Young, your response to her invoking your name in that regard. Well, I would just say that uh, the challenges that we see in downtown Memphis are the same challenges we're seeing all over our community all over this nation. We're all fighting to claim control of our public spaces. And we are working very hard collaboratively with the Memphis Police Department. Uh, we do not have a law enforcement arm of Downtown Memphis Commission. We do all of our work regarding public safety through collaboration. And so we are working with all of those stakeholders to create a safe environment for people to continue to enjoy our living room of downtown. Thank you. Uh, Otis, back to you. All right. Thank you, Richard. Uh, this question for you, Mr. Gibson. You haven't held elected office since 2010 when you last served on the Shelby County Commission. Now, that's a lot of time out of public office. So what would you say to voters who may be skeptical about such a time gap and how that would affect your ability to hit the ground running especially with your lack of experience at City Hall. Well, I would submit to you, Otis, that the public recognize that even though it's been a while since I served as an elected official, not much has changed. As we look at the problems and the issues concerning our constituents throughout Memphis, not a whole lot changed. The process in order to get change to come about hasn't changed. As a businessman, that creativity, that vision for change is something that I possess in my heart, in my soul, and in my activities today. 
At 61 years old, I'm a lot smarter and a lot more uh, talented, if you will, than I was back at 2006. I bring a lot to the table as a businessman here in 2023 that I honestly believe will benefit this city and benefit the city in a way that will be recognized on a national perspective. We talk about Memphis music. We talk about the geographical location that which we sit in. We talk about a person who has the passion to go out and sell Memphis. That's what we're going to be doing. All right, this next question is for Karen Camper. Curtis? Ms. Camper, you've been a Democratic leader at the State House for 15 years, yet Democrats have been unable to pass any significant legislation, including during the most recent special session on public and gun safety. Given that you and fellow Democrats haven't shown effective results at the state level, how can voters expect you to effectively lead Memphis as its mayor at a local level? Well, I disagree with you on your point about, about us not being able to pass legislation. I passed the first expungement bill in the state of Tennessee on a bipartisan level where people told me it would never happen in history. We were in a minority. But I got a like-minded person on the other side that was having the same problems in their community. And we decided it was best for Tennessee. We passed that bill and had people in Memphis fighting against it. Those who didn't want to see people get their records expunged. But we did it. We made history when we did it. And people have now been able to move on with their lives. Last year, this year actually, I passed a bill for Memphis to allow mental health patients who are in the streets get triaged in the streets and not be taken to jail, but be taken to a mental health facility. We have passed numerous pieces of legislation. You just don't hear about it in the media. But thank, thank you for you, the Ms. question. Thank you, Ms. Camper. Uh, this question is for Floyd Bonner. Your commercial says you'll be ready to be mayor on day one. As Shelby County Sheriff, your number one responsibility and the vast majority of your funding, according to the state constitution, is running the county jail system. However, under your leadership, the county jail has surpassed Rikers Island in the percentage of inmates who have died in custody. Then during the Tyree Nichols investigation, you claimed you didn't see the footage of two of your deputies at the scene where Nichols was beaten until weeks later when it was released to the public and for that matter released to the world. What would you say to those who are concerned about trusting you to lead the city based on some of the challenges you have faced leading as sheriff? Well, Richard, thank you for the question. Absolutely. Um, comparing our jail to Rikers Island is, is, is no comparison. You know, there are 244 jails in the state of Tennessee. We're only 41, one of 41, that even report jail deaths that occur in the, in, inside our facility. So we've tried to be transparent. We've tried to to talk about it when we could and try to let the public know what was going on in our facility. Our jail has had 44, which 44 too many deaths, but some of those deaths have occurred where people never step foot in the jails. Many of them have medical issues. They're seeing doctors for the first time um, when, when they come to jail. And Richard, I did make a true statement. It was the first time that I ever saw it during the, the Tyree Snell's uh, incident when he was killed. And when we did, we took appropriate action. We took the steps that we needed to take to uh, suspend those officers and go through an investigation. All right. As we mentioned, uh, former Memphis Mayor Willie Harrington uh, was invited but chose not to attend tonight's debate. But given some polls show him leading everyone here on the stage, if he was here tonight, we would ask him the following question. You probably enjoy the highest name recognition on this stage, due in part to your five terms as mayor, and you want the job again. However, voters remember halfway through your last mayoral term, you left abruptly. At the time, there were reports about questionable business dealings, including the Greyhound bus property downtown, to a missing floor in the FedEx Forum parking deck, and the city workers' pension fund was underfunded. So for voters skeptical of possibly more negative, scandalous type stories emerging during a new Harrington term, what would you tell them? Now obviously the former mayor cannot answer that question because he's not here tonight. We wish he had chosen differently, but we also do not think that saying no to attending debates means you should avoid any accountability when it comes to a debate setting. Moving on. 
We want to mix things up a little here, candidates, and let you ask a question. Now, here's how it's going to work. Each of you can ask a question of one of your opponents. And we ask that you get to the question quickly without it becoming a campaign speech, please. Tough questions are fine, and that's part of running for office. But we're not going to tolerate any personal attacks. Whomever you direct your question to will get 60 seconds to respond. Now, we randomly picked the order for this, and we're starting with Karen Camper. You may ask your question. Mm, I need to ask somebody a question. Yes. We, <laughs> we let your campaign go ahead of time. Okay. Uh, well, now, I guess I would ask Paul Young a question. Um, Paul, you've talked a lot about your work in, as the uh, downtown commissioner. Uh, could you talk to, explain to the people uh, about financing and how that works when you are uh, approving finances and incentives for businesses to function? Yeah, so, so when it comes to incentives in downtown Memphis Commission, uh, we often are in the news about the pilot program, uh, which are taxes that are forgiven over a period of time in return for a development. Uh, but the interesting thing that most people don't realize is we take the fee that those developers pay and we find ways to invest that in the community. We, we call it a community benefit fee. Uh, we take those dollars and we have grants and loans that we provide to small businesses that want to operate in downtown. It's our opportunity to do what we say is creating a downtown for everyone. One of those programs is called Open on Main. Uh, and we have uh, a lot of entrepreneurs that go into these spaces that were formerly vacant and blighted. We actually pay the rent and allow them to realize their dream. Now you have uh, a, a company like Feast and Grave where Christina McCarter is now entering into her own lease and she is thriving as a business owner in downtown as a result of the programs that we've put in place. All right, J.W. Uh, Gibson, what is your question for an opponent? I would like to ask Mr. Paul Young a question as well. <laughs> you are head of downtown commission as an appointee, not an elected official, but an appointee. The downtown Memphis purpose is to oversee downtown development and to keep it clean and safe. Since you have taken over downtown, it's less clean, it's less safe. Big projects have failed under your leadership, like Lowe's Hotel, Grand Hyatt, and the future of 100 North Main is questionable. And Bill Street has a lot of vacancies sitting open today. And all of these projects the taxpayers are on the hook for them. Can you explain to the taxpayers why downtown is the way it is today? So, so first, let me clarify, the taxpayers are not on the hook for it because when you're approved for an incentive in economic development, the incentive is not triggered until the project actually starts. So I want to correct the premise. And you would definitely know about vacancies on Beale Street being that you were uh, the person that owned New, uh, New Daisy for many years and kept it in a vacant blighted uh, position until we reclaimed that property uh, just last year. And you see activities taking place now. Um, in terms of the cleanliness of downtown, that's something that we're working very hard uh, to address. We have a team of individuals. We've now executed additional contracts uh, to make sure that we're cleaning up downtown. With regards to the major projects that you're attributing to my leadership, maybe you haven't paid attention to the national economy, uh, but there are major projects all across this country that have been on pause. Uh, I still am very optimistic that we'll see those projects move forward. Uh, but our goal right now is to continue to create a vir environment where development can flourish, uh, and we're going to work towards doing that. All right, Mr. Young, now it's your turn to ask a question. All right. Um, I'll ask Mr. Bonner. Um, Sheriff, you've been uh, the chief law enforcement officer of Shelby County for the past uh, five years. Um, and I heard your, your previous response, but I would like to hear a more succinct answer on what is it that you can do as mayor that you haven't been able to do as the chief law enforcement officer of Shelby County? If fighting crime is your greatest talent, it seems like you're in the right elected position to do that. 
Well, Mr. Young, I'm glad you asked that question, and I'll go back to something that you said earlier when you, when you made the statement about working with MPD. You've never called the Sheriff's Office. You've never called THP. You don't know where the resources are. So when you start talking about alleviating crime, then you must have a degree of expertise in it. So when we look at downtown and we hear about how unsafe things are, how unsafe the citizens feel, even the blighted property, property that people are leaving from downtown. It's all because of crime, and that's under your leadership. It's under the cleanliness of downtown. So as your next mayor, I will address the crime. I will address the, the crime in the downtown area. This is an all-hands-on-deck position. We've got to call in the THP. We've got to use the sheriff's office. Right now, I'm only, the plan that was given to me, we're only at two intersections downtown diverting traffic. Van Turner, it's your turn to ask a question of an opponent. Thank you. I'll stick with the sheriff. Sheriff Bonner, Gershon Freeman was nude. He got out of his jail cell. Obviously, he was not on. He was nude. Yet he was beat to death by officers in the jail. And yet, when the request was made to release the tape, you refused. When Attorney Crump came to Memphis and said, Sheriff, release the tape just like Chief Davis did in the Tyree Nichols case, Chief Davis didn't wait on the state to come and investigate. She didn't wait on everything to happen that sometimes people say needed to happen. She released the tape of Tyree Nichols' death. You refused to release the tape of Gershon Freeman's death upon request. How can you be a transparent mayor when you've not been a transparent share? Well, thank you, Mr. Turner, for that question as well. Happy to answer that. I do not work for Ben Crump. There are state laws that are in place that governs those particular tapes. The difference between what happened in our jail and what happened out on the streets was is that it did occur in the jail. There's state law that says that those videos cannot be released. So we did what the state law required us to do. We investigated the case. It went to another DA in another part of the state state. Uh, those tapes were given to them as well as TVI and the other DA decided to, against state law, in my opinion, to release those tapes and release that tape to the public. So it wasn't about transparency. It's still, the investigation is still going on. Uh, uh, we're going to uh, do whatever, whatever the uh, Attorney General in Davidson County decides to do. But we hadn't, we hadn't tried to hide anything. All right, Mr. Bonner, your turn to ask a question. Okay, I'll ask Mr. Turner a question. Mr. Turner, doing Tyrese Nichols' incident, we all saw you were with Ben Crump, and we assumed that you were on this legal team uh, because you were there constantly. And then you turns around and it says, or it is being told, that there's a $500 million lawsuit against the city of Memphis. How can you be a part of a $500 million lawsuit and be the mayor of Memphis? Well, I was never part of Mr. Crump's legal team. I was always a representative of the NAACP as its president. I never was engaged by Ms. Robon Wells. I was there to advocate for justice. I was there to advocate for the Tyree Nichols Criminal Justice Act, just like we've argued and fought and protested for the George Floyd Criminal Reform Act in D.C. So the fact that there is a $500 million lawsuit against the city of Memphis, would not Memphis want an attorney that has done these kinds of cases, that has represented individuals in multi-million dollar cases, and has brought those cases to a reasonable, reasonable solution? And so I think my credibility with the community that's been affected by bad policing would suggest that I'm the right person to be in that position to speak to the community and to get a fair resolution for Ms. Ravon Wells and family and to make sure we heal the relationship between law enforcement and community. All right, Mr. Turner, thank you. Ms. McKissick, your turn. You asked the question of Willie Harrington, so I'll ask one of him as well. Where are you? <laughs> I have participated in over 35 candidate debates 
And I want to know, how are you going to be accountable to the people instead of resting on the laurels of something that happened 15 years ago when you were last mayor? A lot has happened in Memphis, in the United States, in the world over the last 15 years. I know that he likes to hold court at Houston's restaurant. But that's just, you can't do enough of that. I actually met with him when I was thinking about running for mayor. I said, Mayor, I said, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Let me get you. You were my superintendent when I was in high school. And he said, well, you know, you're a nice young lady, Michelle. You've got a lovely family. You know, why don't you just focus on that? So for the 60% of our electorate, the women voting in this city, what are you going to tell us? Because we're not just going to sit home, bake cookies, care for our kids. We love them. But you know what? We also like to get out of the house, too. And we want to get things done. So Mr. Mayor, what are you going to do to the 60% of the vote in this city to take care of them and their families and all of Memphis? You can't just hide in your home. You can't just hide at Houston's. You need to come out and face the people and not rest on something that happened 15 years ago. Okay. Another question for all six of you now. Uh, this time we will pick up with where we left off, meaning Ms. McKissick, you're going to get this one first. Otis? Thank you. Now, whoever wins in October, on October 5th, will not, I think it's safe to say, will not have a mandate. In fact, with so many candidates running, it's quite likely that no one, no winning candidate will get above 40%. And it's even possible that they won't get above 25%. So with that in mind, how do you plan to get your agenda and your ideas passed with less, far less than a 40% uh, uh, part of the vote? Ms. McKissick. What's been so wonderful about this campaign season, what I've really enjoyed, is going out into so many communities. I've been to so many neighborhood association meetings on top of all of the candidate forums. And so that's what we need to continue to do. We need to still stay connected to the people beyond the election cycle, still meet in their neighborhoods, meet with them one on one. I have given so many people my, my personal cell phone numbers. Folks reach out to me on Facebook Messenger. So I'm connected to the people, and that's where you continue to hear what they're looking for in their community. Community. You're also talking with our business leaders. You're talking with our philanthropic community. You're talking with our nonprofits. All of these people are going to come together okay. to make a part of what makes Memphis great, and to make us whole again. We've been, we're, we're hurting, we're broken. We need to be made whole again. And with my whole city Memphis plan, that's what it's all about, bringing people to the table, all different types of voices. We've been recycling a lot of the same old voices here in Memphis. It's time to get fresh new perspective. That's what I would do as the next mayor of Memphis. Okay. Mr. Turner, you can next that question. As a county commissioner and as a legislator, I've had to work with six other commissioners at least to get items passed by a majority vote. Sometimes when we needed a supermajority vote, we needed nine votes, and I've been able to do that as well. On some issues where we thought we wouldn't have the support, we were able to get a 13-vote unanimous vote by those commissioners. So to your point, Mr. Sanford, I think that I have a proven track record of working with legislators and policy holders to get agendas passed. Now, the city council has to pass the budget that the mayor of Memphis presents. Once council passes that budget and passes that agenda, the mayor executes and he has sole contracting authority. What you have to do as mayor is make sure that you're giving these communities what they need. What needs to happen in District 7? What needs to happen in District 1 with Ms. Logan? What can we do to give you what you need so that the city gets what it needs? And that's what I'll do. Okay. Mr. Young. When I win this race on October 5th, uh, I want to make sure that I am the uniter for our community. So I want to reach out to all of these candidates. I want to make sure that we are able to reconcile, that we are able to look for the greater good for our city, because all of these people love Memphis. They all love Memphis. And I want them to energize their base, to get behind a vision for our community. Because right now, we have to face our challenges united. And I want to be the person that convenes us all. Uh, I've done this in my background. I was previously director of sustainability, uh, where we put together the Mid-South Regional Green Print Plan, the only plan in our region where you have 18 municipalities across three states in four counties where every legislative body adopted it. It was a plan to connect our region through greenways, parks, and trails. 
all across our region, across partisan boundaries, across racial boundaries, they all approved it because I was able to convince them of the greater good and I'll do the same as mayor. Okay. Mr. Bob. Yes, sir. Thank you, Otis. <clears throat> Again, I have a history, a history of working with the county commission. As the mayor, you must work with the city council. If you go back and you look at my previous two elections, I've crossed over black, white, Republican, and Democrat. I think that says a lot on my candidacy as you're the next mayor, because you cannot work in silos. We must work together to make this great city even greater. And I have that unique ability to bring people together. When we start talking about working together, we talk about communities, working with nonprofits, working with the faith-based community. All of these things are collaborative, and it must be a collaborative effort that we must pull together, because we've got to pull together as one. If we want to see our city be the great city that we all know it is and can be, then it will not happen unless we work together. And I can do that as the next mayor. Okay. Ms. Camper? When I became the Democratic leader, the first thing I did was a statewide listening tour because I knew that we had liberal, conservative, moderate Democrats that wanted to be heard and wanted to be a part of the process. So I made sure I got out and heard from people across the state. What I learned very clearly in the military is when you have a mission, you have to bring people together to accomplish that mission. It's called operational unity. We don't have to agree on everything, but we do agree that we want a better Memphis. We do agree we want safe neighborhoods. We do agree that we want to invest in our youth. So I'll do the same thing. I will get out in the community, have a listening tour. The dust has been settled. I'm the mayor now, how can I and the rest of the city come together to move Memphis forward? That's what I would do. Okay. And Mr. Gibson. Thank you. As a businessman, bringing people to the table to accomplish a common goal is what I've done for the last 30 plus years. I'm quite familiar with that and I'm comfortable with doing that. As your next mayor, I promise each and every one of you, we will not be in this position again, whereby we rely on 15 to 20 percent of the vote to decide who's going to be our next mayor. We will put some type of process in place, either through a primary or through a runoff. We will create processes that will allow this not to ever happen again. I bring that promise to you day one as a mayor. That's what we need to be about, bringing people to the table, not working in silos, not trying to create the division that you see occurring today in our community. That's what I look forward to doing. All right, thank you, Mr. Gibson. All right, we have a couple more uh, questions from our community influencers now. Again, each question will be answered by three of the candidates. So this question will go to Michelle McKissick, Floyd Bonner, and Paul Young. Uh, it comes from the founder of one of the most popular Instagram accounts in Memphis. It's called Unapologetically Memphis. If you haven't seen it, he posts all kinds of videos that are, safe to say, unique uh, to our city. He has 150,000 followers. His question has to do with crime, so let's listen to Marcus Cook. Hi, my name is Marcus Cook, the founder of Unapologetically Memphis. My question for the candidates is this. I have information shared to me all the time about different crazy things that happen in the city that the police may be interested in, but people aren't comfortable sharing that information with the police. If you become the next mayor, how do you plan to improve the relationship between the citizen and the police department. So, a long time problem here. Uh, the divide between the community and the police department. Michelle McKissick, specifically, what would you do to address that? Well, as one of the 150,000 folks who follow Unapologetically Memphis, in fact, one of his posts that this, he had an infinity symbol and then there was drive out tags. He said that's one of the scariest sites in the city of Memphis. So very unique, funny, but very unique. So um, what, what I would love to focus on is getting back to that community policing that everybody's been talking about. Growing up, um, I kind of half grew 
grew up in Westwood. My godmother still lives there, and she has five kids, my mom five kids, and so you have a bunch of kids, you throw them together. And so we would often walk down to the Westwood community pool, and um, there was a police COAC unit there at the same time. We felt incredibly safe. You go there now, the COAC unit doesn't exist. There are weeds growing up through the cracks of the swimming pool, and the community center is not being utilized like how it should be. So I think we have to get back to focusing on community policing. If we get more of those police officers, by the way, we can grow our own by training a lot of our students who are in high school now. We used to have a PST program, police service technicians, so we can have those officers in training to have a community uh, program where we can make us feel safe again. Mr. Bonder. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, Mr. Ransom. Uh, it's about building trust, building relationships. You know, over the years that I've been at the sheriff's office, and even being the sheriff, it's about being community uh, involved, being out in the community where people can feel that they can trust you, they can touch you. I have been that type of sheriff. I've been that type of officer. Yes, community uh, uh, policing is so very important, but we've got to get our numbers up for us to return back to community policing. But when you build that trust in the neighborhoods and you build that trust in the, in the community, then people will have a tendency to tell you things. You know, I have two cell phones and uh, I tell you both of them are very busy and, and I get people from the community that will call me because I give my cell phone numbers out to, to anyone that would like it. So uh, I, I'm there, I'm, I'm already doing those type of things and I will continue to do those things because when you move you move to that direction you, you've got to stay on course okay and mr. young your your solutions yeah it's important that we build trust uh, between the police and the people in our communities uh, I can remember when I was growing up they had basketball leagues where police officers were playing against uh, citizens at community centers young people and things of that nature those types of things allow people to see each other as humans uh, and we have to restore some of those types of things in our community. Uh, earlier this spring, I had an opportunity to participate in uh, Black Men Crown's uh, Youth Town Hall. Uh, and I was there with a, a local musician, NLE Chopper, and there was a young man that was on the panel with us. And this young man said that he likes to steal cars. And we naturally said, well, what is it? What is it to it? And he said, well, there's two things. I'm bored and I need some money. So as we think of how to change those two solvable issues, we should engage officers. He said he was bored. So when I talked about basketball, other activities, doing things where they're interacting with MPD, that's something that we can do. And we can also find jobs for our young people in our city. All right, now a question for our other three candidates about the always uh, controversial MLGW and your role in choosing who leads it. This will be for uh, Karen Camper, Gibson, and then Turner. Let's listen. Hello, I'm Ray Bauer, co-founder of the MLGW Advocacy Group, 21st Century Memphis or Bust. Candidates, as you know, Memphis Light, Gas and Waters Board of Commissioners is tasked with making sure MLGW leadership, like the 11 vice presidents, are doing their jobs so that our publicly owned utility company runs reliably. The seven member board is appointed by the city mayor. How will you review current board member performance to make sure they are holding employees like the 11 vice presidents accountable? Thank you. Ms. Camper, MLGW leadership and the vice presidents, what would you do? Well, one of the things that I plan to do as mayor is have an internal review of how we are functioning within the agency. And I want them to be prepared for a radical transformation because what we've been experiencing, the citizens are tired of it. We have not invested the way that we have, the way that we need to. And so in order to make those investments, I need to understand what's going on, who's in leadership now, what are they doing, what commitments have they made, what policies have they put in place, and then do an evaluation of that in order to decide how I will move forward. I have to evaluate what they're doing now, the different leaders, and then the CEO that'll be appointed by the mayor, make sure that they can live with the plan that I put in place after review. All right, Mr. Gibson, you next. 
so you have heard me say in other forms that I, I really want to take a look at that leadership perspective of Memphis like gas and water. Our prior leader talked to us about the needs for more money for Memphis like gas and water. We raised those dollars. And then the mayor, who not only has the ability to appoint the board, he has the ability to appoint the president. He decided to appoint an individual that has zero experience in the utility industry. Not only do we need to have someone that's on board, and this comes from my business background, because I think it's important that you have someone who's in line with you as the mayor, that understands your goals, what it is you're trying to accomplish. So yes, I think it's very important that we take another look at not only who was appointed as the president of Memphis Like Gas and Water, but we take a look at that board. Do we really have the people who are gonna assist me with taking Memphis Like Gas and Water to the appropriate level? Can they truly evaluate the situation with TVA? And Van Turner. So piggybacking on what Mr. Gibson stated, we do have a president that's in place with a long-term contract, and that contract has been signed. So first we have to review all contracts with the president and other individuals who are involved with MLG and W to see if it's in the best interest of the city. They may be, but we need to review those contracts. It's really a shame that when the lights go out in some of our challenged communities and neighborhoods, they come back on in some of the more affluent neighborhoods and communities. That's an inequity. So first we have to address that inequity and we have to make sure that we have a, a metrics. What are you going to do to address the infrastructure in our most challenged communities? I want them a priority on your list. Show me what you're going to do. I want a, a transparent model about how you're going to do it, and let's execute and get it done. I think that's the type of leadership that Memphis is looking for. Don't say what you're going to do. Do it. And show us what you're going to do and give us a timeline when you're going to execute. All right. Very good. All right, now we're going to move on to our rapid fire round. Uh, candidates, you've been provided with five cards with letter grades A through F. We're going to ask a question requiring you to give a grade, and we hope that you will be ready to answer a quick question or follow up question based on the grade that you give and explaining it. The first question for you what grade would you give Memphis Police Chief C.J. Davis? A through F. And just keep them held up if you could. You'd be a lousy teacher. <laughs> they did put my alphabets in order. Okay. So a lot of B's and C's there, no A's, D's, or F's. All right. Let's move on to the next one. What grade would you give the city and how it has prepared to welcome and take advantage of Ford Motor Company's new Blue Oval City plant and the 30,000 direct and indirect jobs it promises to bring? What grade would you give the city? A through F. Can you repeat that? Yeah. What grade would you get how the city has handled this opportunity with Blue Oval City? Uh, Mr. Gibson, you gave an F, so I'm going to give you just a few seconds to explain why you say it's such a poor performance. I don't believe we have started to properly prepare our city and our constituents to take advantage of the opportunities that Blue Oval is bringing to the table. Not only from a job preparation perspective, but from a transportation perspective. We have over 5,000 jobs that Blue Oval is talking about making available to us. And we got out of the workforce development business. Okay, We're okay. not prepared. Thank you for making your point there. Now, whoever wins will be replacing Mayor Jim Strickland, who has had the job for the past eight years. And while he won't be on the ballot, how you feel about how he did during those eight years, I think would be of interest to voters. So what grade would you give his performance in office overall, A through F? And just hold them up if you could. Ah, straight B's except for Mr. Gibson. Why are you so critical here? <laughs> I am not one who believes in being brilliant at the basics. I just think it makes no sense whatsoever. The basics has been the common services that the mayor is supposed to provide to the city is what he ran on twice. And that's not happening. Okay, I want to make your... Pick up, 
All right, well, let me make your point. That's fine. Now, we've asked a lot of serious questions tonight, as you know, but uh, we want to make sure that we have time for you to give your, your closing statements, and that's what we're going to do here. Uh, we're going to give each uh, candidate a last minute to make their final pitch to voters. Uh, candidates, as you know, early voting starts in just four days, and soon voters will get to have their say. We randomly selected the order for these closing statements, and Van Turner, you get to go first. Memphis, we are at a stage now where we have to do better. We have to make sure that we are addressing the issues that are affecting the everyday average citizens in this city. We have to address poverty, and we have to address it in an effective way. My family in Memphis starts in Lemoyne Gardens. Shout out to the LOC family in Soulsville. And from there, my family moved to Bean Hampton. My father was the 1961 valedictorian graduate of Leicester High School. My three children attend East or at the East Campus. I'm committed to this community because I want for your family what I want for my family. Clean streets and safe neighborhoods. We want effective policing throughout the community. We want to make sure that a child born in 38112 or 38111 has the same opportunities as young people born in other zip codes in the suburbs. That's what I'm committed to. I passed him a note asking her to circle yes. I'm asking you to circle yes to Van Turner being your next mayor. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Michelle McKissick, your turn for a closing remark. Hi, I'm Michelle McKissick, and Memphis is my hometown. I have lived in the city of Memphis my entire life, save when I went off to college. With my plan, Whole City Memphis, I want to reach out to all of Memphis. I want to reinvest in communities like the one I grew up in in Cherokee, which is next door to Orange Mound. We want to make sure that every Memphian, as I've been going across all of Memphis talking with folks, they, would, they feel neglected. They said, well, you know, what about me in Southeast Memphis? What about me in Raleigh and White Haven? I want to say that I'm caring about every Memphian. And while I'm at it, I want to talk about who is actually going to serve as the next mayor of Memphis. We've never had a woman mayor. 60% of the vote in this city are women. We need to own that power. I am here to reach out to not just women. I'm here to reach out, as we say here in Memphis, everybody. So I want your vote. I'm asking you to go to my website, michelleformemphis.com, to explore more about my whole city Memphis plan. Thank you. All right, Floyd Bonner, 60 seconds. Thank you, Richard. And again, thank the listening audience for listening tonight. I'm Floyd Bonner. I'm running for mayor. I want your vote. I want your support. I believe all of us can, will say that crime is the number one issue in our city, and crime must be addressed by a professional law enforcement officer, a law, law enforcement officer that's been here all his life, that has been committed to this city, but then also has the heart to to deal with intervention and prevention with our kids. Yes, we do need to clean up our streets, and we've been talking about that all across the city. Blight is a problem, but it all still relates back to crime. Uh, economic development, you've heard of me talk about Blue Oval tonight. Blue Oval is exciting. It will be exciting across the state and exciting for the area of Memphis, but we've got to be ready. We've got to address crime. A safe city is a prosperous city. Vote Floyd Bonner for mayor. J.W. Gibson. Thank you. I enjoyed myself this evening. As a businessman, accountability and efficiency is very important to me. So I have got to go back to a statement that was made earlier. When we talked about the taxpayers being on the hook, the mobility subsidiary of downtown Memphis Commission paid $10.7 million for 100 North Main. That's being on the hook. When you talk about, Mr. Young, me leaving New Daisy in plight, I spent a million dollars on the New Daisy, and we had national shows coming through the New Daisy. I sought to renew that lease, and until your administration came into the play, we were about to do that. Earlier it was mentioned about us being stuck in the mud in comparison to some of the other cities across the state of Tennessee. We truly are stuck in the mud. There's an opportunity for us to do something different. Businessman Hazen, businessman Corker, businessman Bredesen took their prospective city to a different level. We can do that here in Memphis with the businessman as okay. leader of this city. Thank you, sir. Karen Camper. Thank you. I am the only candidate with 15 years experience in Nashville with a credible record of getting things done across the aisle. 
experience matters. I am the only candidate with 21 years of military service, retired U.S. Army Warrant Officer, with the discipline that it's gonna take to move our city forward. Discipline matters. I am the only candidate who made history in the state of Tennessee as a House Democratic leader, the first African-American woman and the first African-American to do that. Leadership matters. I'm ready to move this city forward. I'm ready to make history with you as the first woman mayor of the city of Memphis. Reach out to me at Ready for Camper on all my social medias. I appreciate your vote. Thank you for being here tonight and participate in this debate. Paul Young, you have one minute. Memphis, we have a very, very important decision in front of us. You have 17 candidates that are running for your vote right now. And it's your job, it's your responsibility to choose wisely. I'd like to ask that you vet all of us. Look at our backgrounds. Everybody's gonna say that they're gonna do all of the great things to stop crime, clean up our neighborhoods. But the question is, who can actually get things done? Judge us based on that track record. I represent the next generation of leadership that our city is desperately asking for. I think about my childhood growing up in Oak Haven and graduating from East High School and all the amazing memories that I have. The question before us is what type of memories will our kids have? They're dependent on us to get this right. Whoever wins this election is gonna decide our trajectory as a city for the next 10 years. And I am the right person to lead this community. I've been doing the work for the past 20 years and I'm gonna to continue to do the work as your mayor. Ad Young from Memphis on all social platforms. All right, candidates, uh, that concludes ABC 24's Your Voice, Your Vote mayoral debate. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. We wish you the best of luck in the remaining days of your campaigns. How about a round of applause for all the candidates who took part tonight? No matter, no matter who you support, uh, I think it's very obvious that we have six people here who really care about this city, and that's what matters most. Uh, as for you voters, uh, this is an important election. So much is at stake for our city. We hope that what you saw tonight uh, will help you make an informed decision. It's now up to you to decide who you think will be best, the best person to lead the Bluff City and to move it forward. As we mentioned, early voting starts this Thursday on the 15th, and the election is October 5th. Mom always said, if you don't vote, you give up the right to complain. Uh, let's have the kind of turnout that shows Memphians cared enough to show up for their city. Uh, before we sign off to bring you ABC's Monday Night Football matchup, we invite you to join us after the game for ABC 24 News at 10 when we'll hear from several undecided voters who were also watching the debate tonight. Curtis, to engage you one more time, we got the Jets coming up. Do you care to make a prediction on the game? <laughs> Jets, blowout. Jets. Okay, well, that, that wasn't that hard, but <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, we'll find out what uh, those undecided voters heard tonight and if it helped make up their minds. Uh, thanks to our partners, the Tri-State Defender and also Positively Memphis, a nonprofit that that's working hard to alleviate child hunger in our city. I also want to thank my fellow panelists, Mr. Otis Sanford over here and Mr. Curtis Weathers. Uh, it was a pleasure sharing the stage with both of you. And thanks to you at home. Go out and vote and have a good night, everybody. All right, we're going to be up for a little bit. If you want to shake hands or something, we'll have a little bit of time. <laughs> well, we go to 6.58. <laughs> Thank you.